I'd like to show, start off tonight with a little bit of a review. There we go. Pondering the Proverbs. And in this review, uh, some of you can see it, some of you can't. I apologize over there. We'd like to bring us up to where, that, uh, where we have been speaking and where, where we have come. We have done 20, 19 weeks on the Proverbs. This is the 20th week. We are still not out of the first category, and that is the Lord God and the Almighty God. But you to notice, the author of wisdom is God. We talked about it from the beginning. We began what he delights in. God loves righteous living. He loves pure thoughts and words. He loves acceptable worship and prayer. And he loves honest dealing. We looked at specific topic uh, uh, groups of Proverbs that prove these things. These are not things that we wrote down and then looked for Proverbs. We, this, you remember that we're doing a topical study of the book of Proverbs. Then I want you to notice that there are some things that he hates and displeases him. A proud heart or attitude, injustice and false accusations, sexual immorality, joy over another's trouble. We, uh, the passage that we just talked out, we went through that passage, or we just, that we're memorizing, we went through that passage and talked about that passage also. We talked about God's actions and responses. How does He act? How does He react to things? We all have personalities. What's God's personality? How does He react when somebody does something? I've been reading through First and Second Kings, and sometimes God, there's something small, and God reacts in a great way, in a powerful way to it. And I think, yeah, He got His one up and or whatever that word is, come up and or whatever that is. And uh, then the next chapter, we'll talk about another king, and he looked to me in my eyes twice as bad, and nothing ever happens to him. And I, I don't understand those things, but I'm learning to. And it's good for you in your personal study, when you go through the Word of God, and you see, especially the Old Testament, why did God harshly judge guys by, like, like uh, what was his name, who grabbed the ark? Uh, Uzzah, is that right? He, he, all he does is study the ark, and he dies for it. But yet you have kings that year after year after year just were terrible and wicked. And God doesn't do much to them. Why is that? Because our sense of justice is not his sense of justice. What we think should be big punishment in his. The American Constitution is not the heart of God. The American legal system is not the heart of God either. Tonight, we come to the third thing, his actions and responses. He has an intimate relationship with his own. That is, with his own children. Just the whole idea of God Almighty willing to be intimate with me or with you is an amazing thing. The fact that he wants to be close to us. It's enough that he redeemed us, that he saved us, but he wants to have fellowship. You know, on a daily basis, you and I fail him and we fall short. On a continual basis, if we're very honest, there's no reason why God should want to draw near to us. Would you agree with that? We say amen. Are you with me tonight? In fact, if you, focal, if you uh, make that a focal point of your life, like a missionary named David Brainerd did, you'll do what David Brainerd did. David Brainerd spent, he was a great man of God, led many to Christ. I believe he died as a young man. I think he was 34 years old. But he spent long periods of time out in the woods just wailing and, and crying that he was unworthy to serve the Lord God. He saw a true sense of who he was. Some of you tonight perhaps feel that way. You feel like you're so unworthy. And, and the truth of the matter is you are. But God is not. Christ is not, I should have said. Christ is not unworthy. And you remember that he sees you through Christ. That is so important to your depression or to your encouragement or to your joy of your life to realize that your standing with God is not based upon whether you can impress God or not or whether you meet his standards. All of sin and fall, fall, fallen short of the glory of God. The truth is that Christ makes us so we don't fall short any, anymore. All right, so why would God want to have an intimate relationship with us? I cannot do that. I cannot give you the answer why, but I know that he does. You say, how does he want to have an intimate relationship with us? Well, first of all, he walks with us privately. Nothing else is going to be up here. It's all going to be up here. He walks with us privately. Take your Bibles and turn to chapter 3 and verse 32 of Proverbs 3.32. He walks with us privately. 
Do you have someone, before we read this verse, that you can share your personal secrets with? Maybe a small group of trusted friends, an assembly of close friends. How many of you have a friend like that, someone you can entrust? Uh, Anne of Green Gables would have called uh, them kindred spirits. Somebody that thinks like you, they laugh at the same things as you, even if it's, you know, sometimes it's dumb things. You have those things in your life that just hit you a certain way and others don't get it, but you get it. And uh, how many of you would say that you have a kindred spirit in your life, in so somewhere, a friend or some, someone from youth, a kindred spirit? All right. I have one in Chicago. His name is Jeff, spelled with a G, G-E-O-F-F. -F. We have shared a lot of funny experiences together. I've not known him that long, maybe 10 years. And he was one of my youth uh, directors uh, and when I was a youth pastor. He walked in one day, and I, and I knew that uh, he walked into our church, and, and he was just, he spent a little time there, and I knew there was something different about him. I knew that there was a connection that I had with him. They were a young couple at the time, no children, and... Uh, he was from, I now found he was from Bob Jones, and there was some connection there. And then he walks up with me, and I've been praying for God to send me a good youth director. And he walks up, and he says, hey, you have any need for anybody to help you in the youth group? And from then on, we went through everything and anything together, and often we talk together. I hope you have somebody like that. It's good. The Bible says a man that has friends must show himself friendly. Perhaps somebody here tonight, you don't have a kindred spirit because you have not made yourself a kindred spirit to somebody else. You've not allowed yourself to be vulnerable. You know, uh, I don't know who said it. I don't think it was Shakespeare. Uh, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. But the truth is that it's better to become vulnerable and to try to build a friendship with somebody than to hold yourself back and never get hurt. You're going to get hurt sometimes in a friendship. This idea of kindred spirit is found in the Word of God concerning God and you. It's found in verse number 32 of chapter 3, and it says this. The Bible says, For the froward is an abomination, is abomination to the Lord, but his God's secret is with the righteous. His secret. That's a strange thing. Secrets, secrets are no fun. Whatever the rest of it is. Secret. In this passage, the word secret here is talking about the assembly of kindred spirits. It's talking about a close grouping. A close grouping. The child of God, his secret is with the righteous. That is, those that are saved. It doesn't talk, it's not talking about God holding back uh, from you, revealing some mysterious thing. You know, you can look at a passage like this and you say, What's the secret? I don't know the secret. Well, what the verse is saying is that God himself is near the righteous person. What does that mean, his secret? It's an intimate connection that I cannot explain that is in the realm of faith. I'll talk about it in a minute. This is found other places in Scripture. Psalm 25, verse 14, the same word, same idea. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Job 19, 19. Uh, this is a bad way that it's used. Job, you remember his friends? They were just great buddies, weren't they? Kindred spirits. You know, when he was down, they gave him a kick. Why have you been sinning? You ever have a friend like that? You know, you had the worst day, so they come and kick you. You know, and point out something wrong. You go and tell it. It's like my brother. I keep on talking about my brother because I'm thinking about my brother. I want to be with my brother. Uh, they come... You know, I, I'll call him sometimes and I'll say, you know, this is going wrong. And I, can't, I had this kind of this thing with this person. And, and he'll say, Dan, you know, I'll be waiting for this big, you know, encouragement and uplifting. He'll say, well, what'd you do wrong? What'd you do to upset him? You know, it's just a kick in the, in, you know, that's what Job says when he says this. All my inward friends, the same word secret that's found in 332 in our, in our passage. All my inward friends abhor me. And they that, whom I loved are turned against me. His kindred friends turned against him. God says to the righteous man, that is those who are covered in the blood of Christ, righteousness, not in your goodness. And I praise God that you can say you're a righteous person if you're saved. He says that his secret is with you, that you are his kindred friend. You're, you're, he is intimate. He is willing and wants to be intimate to you. It's through the realms of faith. You're not going to get extra biblical revelation. If you're looking for that kind of secret, you, know, you better go to Charismatic Church because you're not going to get it from the Word of God. All right? It's not there either. It says, uh, the idea is that the secret communion lies in the realm of faith. It is knowing that when you pray, God is hearing and responding in some way that you don't understand. 
It's not necessarily a feeling. I like to say it this way. It's a spiritual perception. When you pray, there's something deep inside of you and inside of me that you know that the Lord hears it. And that when you're talking to Him, that He does bear your infirmities. He does bear it. You know, a lot of times there are things that cloud that way. And I'm not saying that every time you have... There's sometimes, honestly, when I pray, I can't... You know, and I, I know it's bouncing... I feel like it's bouncing around the room. You know, boing, boing, my prayer. You know, I know it's... I just feel like I'm just talking to myself. And I feel like I'm with myself. But then there are other times that I know that the Lord God hears me. It's an assurance that I know in the depths of my heart. I would argue that the only way to explain this to somebody is that they experience it for themselves to know that the Lord God is there. Even when you're, you've done something against Him, even when you're rebellious, even when you're running, <coughs> you know that the Lord God... Old Jonah knew from the depths of the belly of the whale that the Lord God heard him. The Holy Spirit witnesses to your spirit that you're walking with God. The secret is not weird. It's not mystic. There's not some revelation and you're not glowing. And it doesn't mean you talk in tongues in your prayer closet. It's a solid assurance that you know that He walks with you. You have His secret. And that secret is Him Himself. He's within you. The secret, the word means kindred spirit. Intimate fellowship is what the word means. His intimate fellowship is with the saved. Many Christians' lives, this, assur this assurance at times is molested in life's valleys, in battles of faith. Have you ever gone through a stretch where you felt like God was nowhere? I've been there. You felt like that, uh, you know, something's wrong. I, don't, I feel like I'm all alone. In teen years, young people often experience doubt of their salvation because, you know, for reasons, sometimes it's hormonal, uh, if you have teenagers, please expect that. Expect young ladies often struggle with assurance of their salvation as their life or their, their bodies are changing. Sometimes it's just that everything is changing in life and they feel like God is nowhere. And sometimes they feel like that the older people, they have something that they, don't, they can't have. And there's a lot of reasons for it. But just be patient. The Lord knows His own. The Lord knows His own. Sometimes in medical problems, that assurance will, will, will uh, fluctuate. You don't know where God is. Sometimes in depression, through deep, dark depression. You know, I've experienced some of that too, but even to the depths of despair, I've clung to the Lord, and He has clung to me. And uh, I, in the depths of the despair, of the terribleness, of the darkness, of the night, please understand that God is your refuge and your strength. And when you get alone with Him, please know He is intimately interested in being near you as a kindred spirit. And uh, when you shut out everything, most of the time we don't shut out everything. How in the world can God minister to our hearts if we don't shut out anything? You know, the prayer closet and the Word of God is a very literal thing. And that is you get away, you get away from your wife, you get away from your husband, your children, your grandchildren, and you spend an extended time alone with the Lord God, just you, and you get honest with Him. And you pour out your soul to the Lord. You pour out your soul to the Lord. You pour out the depths of your heart. And there's a peace that is there that you cannot explain. It's the secret of the righteous. And you know when you get up, you don't know the answers, but you know the Lord has heard you. And somehow that's enough. And somehow that's enough. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, I, I have come to the Lord at times and I was so broken and I did not know what to do. And I just poured out my heart to God. And when I got up, there was no answer there. I want to tell you a story, and we're not going to get through here. In the old building, we began praying about Mrs. Sears, built, Mrs. Sears' property. How many of you remember that? Back in the old building. And we prayed that the Lord God would do something that really didn't look like it could be done. I don't know at what point it was, perhaps after we'd got under contract with her the first time, and it failed. But the Lord burdened my heart in a great way. And I, I think that we're starting to study that passage, there's no restraint to the Lord. And I, I started getting a little belligerent. You know, God answers prayer, right? Does He answer prayer, yes or no? Yes. All right? And I'm a preacher, and He's supposed to answer my prayers. And uh, this property, the, you know, the engineer kept on telling us how valuable this property is to our whole property. And it's not good that we don't have it, and that we need to get it. We need to try to acquire it if we can. And I knew it was good for all around. I knew it was of the Lord that we have this... At that point, I guess we were in the middle of the renovation. And one night I stayed late after, after uh, 
the office hours were closed, and I got to thinking about this matter and trying to ask the Lord what to do. I'm telling you fact, okay? I looked at, I looked at the Bible, and I'm a literalist. I'm a literalist. And I see these guys in the Old Testament ripping their shirts and running their heart and throwing it out before the Lord. I see Mordecai in the Old Testament. The Jews are going to die. He lays on the road, and he rips his clothes. I love, this is a classic. I know that, that Queen Esther was a blonde. I know she was. They came in and they told her, Mordecai, you read the Bible. They told her, Mor they told, uh, her Mordecai, thy uncle, lays in the streets with shredded clothes, something like that. And you know what she did? She sent him a change of clothes. There's no question this woman was blonde. She didn't get it at all. You know, he was in duress. He didn't need clothing. All right? I'm sorry, blondes. I don't mean to pick on you, but I kicked my cat and I can't talk about the cat. One night, thinking about these things, how many of you know what sackcloth and ashes are? How many of you you've seen you've read those Old Testament passages and some of the New Testament? Okay, you understand the point. I'm a literalist. All right. Sometimes they 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 would they would uh, humble themselves before the Lord God so that He would hear their prayer. That's the whole point. Humbling themselves. It's not for other people's sake. Old Jeremiah, he laid around. He, he he laid around naked at one point. He laid around uh, muddy. He threw him into the pit. He cries out to the Lord. So there at my office, I did the only thing I knew what, what to do. My wonderful jacket and tie and whatever concerning the Sears property. Got on my face before the Lord and took my garbage trash that was full of trash and poured it out on top of me and cried out to the Lord for the Lord to hear me. Now some of you, you think that's stupid. I'm going to tell you, it was a little wet, and I don't know what was in there. But I want to tell you something. The Lord God hears the prayer of the humble. And uh, most of the time, I'm just an arrogant jerk. But I believe the Lord God answered my prayer yesterday. You know? The Lord God is interested in intimately walking with His children. The second part of that is that the second thing shows that he's in, interested is that he hears our prayers. And that works right in with what I just told you. Turn over to 1529. 1529. <clears throat> the Bible says in 1529, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. He heareth, you see that? He heareth the prayer of the righteous. What a precious word of God this is. I was talking with a new member, Ray Healy, this week. And we were talking about the words of Scripture and why it's so important when you read the word of God to know what the words mean. And that's why we put a Vine's Concordance and a Strong's Concordance out here. To understand that the Bible is not written in English. It's very important that you understand that. This word heareth, the word here in the Old Testament, appears in several places. There are several different words. This word heareth is what a, what a precious word this, this is, a precious verse, because I want to tell you what it means. The word prayer here is translated in the King James Version in two ways. It's the same word, understand, it's the same meaning. All right? In both places it's the same meaning. The context determines uh, how you translate. The word is translated in one place here, and in the other, other place it's the word obey. As I did the word study on it, here's the idea. God is not just saying that he hears the prayer of his... Someone remind me, I'm away from my notes. What verse are we on here? It says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. It doesn't just mean he hears with his ears. It means, remember, the other place it's translated what? Obey. It is a he an attentive hearing that yields a reaction. Okay, do you know what that means? God doesn't just hear the prayer of the righteous. He responds. He acts on it. Now that's good. That's very, very good. And it's a promise of the Word of God. And He chose this Word for you to understand and for you to know that when you get on your face before God or when these three guys walked up here tonight, that God hears and acts on prayer. It's a promise. It's real. 
This is not, God does not add up like sand your prayers until it balances the scale and the scale goes down and then he decides to answer. That's not how it works. The Bible says that every prayer is responded on. It may be a timing situation with God. It might be a choice for him to answer that later. My prayer about Mrs. Sears that night was answered whatever it was, whenever it is. Over a year later that prayer came. Please understand, he hears attentively and responds to your prayer. Why is that? Because you're robed in the righteousness of Christ. That's why. Because he sees you in Christ. And you have standing with God. What a wonderful proverb, of a bit of wisdom that he knows uh, me and that he wants to intimately work in my life. There are two more that we'll handle next, next time we come together. But what a wonderful thing tonight. And I just want to understand, I just want to know, when is the last time you desired to be intimate with him? His promises are sure. He walks with you in the secret place. When you come to pray there, you know a funny thing that I thought, you know what happens to me? I think about everything that's going on during the day when I pray. And uh, the, uh, one solution for that is to keep a pad and a, pa a pen beside you. And when you're praying and you're thinking about your schedule, you jot down what you don't want to forget. You know, you, I got to call Aunt Maybell. So you, try, you jot down Aunt Maybell. And then you can focus on the Lord again. <clears throat> but the fact is that I'm a great multitasker and so are you. You're praying rote memory prayers. Rut phrases. And you're thinking about, oh, I got to get the dinner ready. I got, I, oh, I don't think I got any pot roast. Oh, I got, oh, I got to, I wonder what time it is. And you're saying all these things. And you know what? They're so memorized. They just come out to you like a robot. Be with a military man. Be with a, you know, be with my relative. Be with Tamara and Tressa. Be with, you know, this, this. And it's just, just they just come out of you. I don't like people. Do you, do you ever have somebody who multitasks when they're talking to you? <laughs> Tonight somebody came up here and I asked permission to multitask when I was talking to her. My brother, again. Every once in a while I'll be talking to him and I'll hear this in the background. He's typing a letter as he's talking to me on the phone. That irritates me. Have you ever had anybody like that? I told a guy yesterday, it wasn't him, it was another guy. It was an important guy. And I said, listen, I, I can hear in the background you got something to do, so I'm just going to let you go, all right? That just irritates me. If I can't have their undivided attention, I don't want any of their attention. You know, it's, it's, it's just like saying, you're not near as important as what I'm doing. You know, <laughs> it's like the, it's like the uh, teen girls you see walking in the mall. They all like to be together, so they're on the cell phones to everybody else. <laughs> what is that? Do you think God feels that way? The multitasking in prayer, yes, he does, absolutely. We're thinking about everything else except being focused on the throne of heaven. And we're putting in our time. You know, what's the point of saying memorized phrases? What is the point of that? There's no point to it. We have got to talk real to God. We've got it. You know, we, we can't get into that. You know, Heavenly Father, thank you for the food. Amen. And we say the same things over and over. God wants to be intimate with you. What if you treated your wife that way? What if you just, you know, you got a couple phrases down. You sure look nice in that. Honey, what would you like for dinner? You sure look nice in that. You know, can you pick up the kids after work? You sure look nice in that. Well, that's a nice thing to say, isn't it? And we say a lot of nice things to God that don't make any sense. That They have no meaning. We don't really mean them. Dear Heavenly Father, I think you're just a holy and merciful and wonderful God. We're not even thinking about what those words mean. Merciful. We just let it spits out of us. There's no thought. Our, our, our tongue, merciful and holy, is right here. It's not here. It's not here. We're not thinking about how he's merciful and holy. We're just saying the words. That's not an intimate relationship. What if I always talk to Amy that way? I only talk about to her half the time that way. But what if I always talk to her that way? We didn't have much of a relationship. You know, maybe, maybe this is turning into a, uh, you know, a marriage seminar. I don't know. Has your relationship with God gotten like that? Do you know He wants to be intimate with you? And that's the wisdom from the Proverbs tonight. 
You see that in the fact of, of the secret place, that, he, that kindred place with you and him alone that you know he's hearing you. You just know it. You know, you may not feel any better when you get up, but you know God heard you. And then also that he answers your prayer. He hears and acts on it. Would you bow your heads tonight? We're done. The invitation is there to you in your seat. And it's within your heart. And I would encourage you with all of my heart that as the Lord has dealt with me about this, these matters in preparation for tonight, that you would allow Him to deal with you. Would you tell the Lord how much you appreciate His willingness to be intimate with you? Would you apologize to Him for how often you multitask during your devotion time and your prayer life and think of everything else except Him? I want to give you a few moments just to be with the Lord. That you desire to be near us. Why would any, of, any being of your stature care anything about us? Father, we fail you on a daily basis. Nearly every attitude that we possess is laced with sin. We ask, oh God, Lord God, be exalted and lifted up because you have compassion to reach down, to regard our low estate. Thank you for caring for us, Lord, for hearing and act upon our prayer. As we continue praying tonight, I pray that you would hear us now in Jesus' name. Amen. If I can have your attention, please, as I said, we are going to, let's go to this. If you love the Lord with all your heart, and you're amazed that he saved you, say amen. 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 I remind the deacon. Their wives that we have a meeting upstairs in my office and everyone else you're dismissed tonight.